20 years ago, I almost died on this river. I never thought I'd be back. But life is a funny way of not giving you what you want, but giving you what you need. Yeah, I ran a rapid called Scissors that just went wrong. And, um, you know, that'll happen out there. But like anything, when you're in the thick of it, you're just trying to, you're just trying to, you know, survive. My name is Jerry Moffat, and that was a clip from The Tenth Step, a documentary film I recently finished after three years. Today, I want to talk to you about the backstory to the film, which is basically summed up by the writer Renier Maria Rilke, who said, the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. I've spent the last three decades based mainly in the Himalayas, carving out a professional career in the world of adventure travel, expedition kayaking, and filmmaking. It's a life that's taken me across every continent, down hundreds of rivers, and twice to the summit of Mount Everest. Over the years, I've met thousands of people from all walks of life, but there's one person who stands out, someone who left a huge impression on me. She was the first person I ever met who truly embodied the notion of living her question. And although our time together was brief, I will never forget her. I was 24 years old and running a rafting company with my friend Guy Robbins in Gilgit, northern Pakistan. Now, this is an area where the Himalaya, the Karakoram, the Pamir, and the Hindu Kush mountain ranges converge. It's unimaginably spectacular, remote, and dangerous. But with the recent opening of the Karakoram Highway, this was the new frontier for Himalayan adventure travel. And there were a few intrepid travelers who came through here on their way to other places. The person I want to tell you about is Margaret. She stepped off the bus in Gilgit, all five feet ten of her. In Scotland, we'd say she was a robust woman. <laughs> now, I'd love to show you a picture of Margaret, but at the end of our first season, we barely had enough money for food, let alone film for the camera. Margaret's plan was to travel overland up the Karakoram Highway, cross the 16,000-foot Kunjara Pass, and head to Kashgar in China. From there, she planned to cross the Tibetan Plateau to Lhasa. Now, that's pretty ambitious. But what really put Margaret on a pedestal for us was that she was a 70-year-old great-grandmother from Australia. She was traveling alone, and wait for it, Margaret only had one arm. She told us how she'd lost her arm in a horrific bus crash in India 20 years ago, and she hadn't been back to Asia since. But with her husband passed and her children grown, Margaret wanted to see the world again, and she wasn't letting anything stop her. When she heard that we were raft guides, she got all excited told us how she'd been in Zimbabwe and wanted to go rafting on the Zambezi, but they wouldn't take her because she only had one arm. At which point, Guy and I looked at each other and immediately said, Margaret, we'll take you rafting. But the truth was, Guy and I were getting ready to close up shop. Temperatures in the upper Karakulm were rising, glaciers were melting, and the rivers were getting enormous but we just couldn't deny Margaret. So there we were, with a very excited 70-year-old great-grandmother. 
holding on to the bow line with one arm at the front of the raft, howling with delight. I'm on the oars, yelling commands at Margaret to shift from one side of the raft to the other to stop the boat from flipping. Guy's in his kayak trying to maintain some semblance of safety. It was completely mad and brilliant. The next day, we put Margaret on a bus, leaving Gilgit for the Kunjarab Pass. And I remember Guy running after the bus because Margaret had left her bag by the side of the road. She just took her bag, laughed, waved, and disappeared in a cloud of dust and diesel up the Karakoram Highway. You know, Margaret probably had no business being where she was or doing what she was doing, but she wasn't worried. She was living her question, willing to accept whatever the universe was serving her that day. Looking back, I think that Margaret and I shared a similar sense of freedom because I was in my first act in life and she was entering her third act. It's the second act that's messy for most of us. <laughs> Full of expectations, big decisions, stress, doubts. When I turned 50, a few years ago, I'd become disillusioned with my career, ambivalent about many of my relationships, and maybe most importantly, I didn't know what my purpose was in life. To be honest, I wanted a reset, but I had no idea how to do that. So I did something drastic, quit guiding, drained the bank account, and took off. Midlife crisis, brilliant move. <laughs> Depended on who you, who you asked. Oh, and I decided to take my camera and film everything along the way. I figured whatever happened was going to be magic or tragic. <laughs> I ended up in Delhi, bought a second-hand Royal Enfield motorcycle and set off on a 4,000-mile solo trip across the length of the Himalayas. I spent 108 days revisiting the people and places that had shaped my life. It was an amazing adventure. And I came home inspired and hopeful, but still seeking answers. Little did I know the universe had more plans for me and that my adventure was really just beginning. I'd been home about a week when I shattered my leg in a freak skiing accident. Surgeon said I was lucky to keep it. And after five operations, I had four plates, 24 screws, a skin graft, and I was looking at a long and challenging road to recovery. Four months into my rehab, a series of devastating earthquakes rocked Nepal. And many of the people and places I'd visited five months earlier were completely shattered. I was just learning how to walk again, but I knew I needed to go out and help. And I have to tell you, it was heartbreaking. How do we make sense of life when tragedy strikes us. Well, when I was in hospital, I woke from surgery and somebody had placed a plaque by the head of my bed that simply said, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. And those words had a profound effect on me. For you to understand what I decided to do next, you need to know that a river has always run through my life. Rivers have been my home and my escape since I was a, a wee boy. And the place that I needed to go after healing from my injury and experiencing the devastation in Nepal was a river. But not just any river. I was drawn back to run a very specific river one more time the river I almost died on 20 years ago, 
the Grand Canyon of the Stikine. I know I'm not here to conquer the river, but I am here to live a question in the crucible of this canyon. But like anything, when you're in the thick of it, you're just trying to, you know, survive. <laughs> Big storm coming in. Perfect. <laughs> 16 years old. There you go. There you go, Jerry. Nice. I know I'll never run this river again, and time and age will soon put it beyond my reach. Coming back took everything I had, but it's in those moments on the thin red line that everything unnecessary burns away. All that's left in you is what you really care about what you want to live for. Returning to the Stikine after 20 years was definitely risky. But I remember Margaret's traveling, and I understand now. It really didn't matter if anyone else understood her reasons for going, and it didn't matter if anyone understood why I needed to go back. I knew. We all have our stikines in life, things we know we want to do, but we're afraid to do them because we're afraid of how things might turn out. We're actually taught to fear making mistakes. At 53 years old, I'll tell you this, whatever experience I have has come from making mistakes. And I've made a lot of mistakes. The truth is, you can't connect the dots in life going forward. You can only connect the dots looking backwards, trusting that everything we go through in life will make sense someday. I started this journey with a lot of expectations and seeking a lot of answers. I'm still on the journey, but I've stopped expecting. I'm just experiencing. And as Rilke so wisely predicted, I find myself inspired instead of disillusioned, in love instead of ambivalent, and clear about my purpose. I don't know what happened to my old friend Margaret, but I do know this. Margaret was living her question. And after 30 years, she's finally taught me to just live mine. And all that filming I did along the way, well, like everything in life, it made sense in the end and became my first feature documentary, The Tenth Step. Thank you.